just shut up and listen. And listen good, Chief. I, Jean Philip Risco, say this as a representative of all Zaka TV news teams. Hello, y'all. This is Louie, and welcome back to Retrosaurus. When it comes to the phrase survival horror, if you're like me, the first thing that pops into your head brain is likely something along the lines of Resident Evil, Dead Space, or even The Evil Within. These games are filled to the brim with enemy encounters requiring some form of direct combat. Whether it requires the use of firearms or melee weapons, the game's primary focus is almost entirely on action-packed, violent combat. On the other hand, there is a non-insignificant portion of the genre that removes the idea of combat completely to deliver a more passive, tense experience. Games such as Clock Tower and Remothered instead prioritize environmental hazards or self-defense mechanics to really drive home the survival aspect without giving players too much control. The effectiveness of a survival horror game honestly comes down to how well the narrative themes balance with player control. I'm of the opinion that the more control a player has over their character, the less effective the horror elements will be. So how do you balance effective horror with player control without becoming too action-y or too passive? This is where a third type of survival horror has its time to shine, and it's honestly more common than you'd think. For today's purposes, I'll be referring to this concept as non-violent or indirect combat, as it borrows aspects from both violent combat-oriented titles in addition to more passive experiences to create a uniquely engaging survival horror experience. One of the more notable series that bucked the action-oriented trend of popular horror titles was the Fatal Frame series, which swapped guns and bludgeoning weapons for a nifty-looking camera. While Fatal Frame is one of the more notable examples of non-violent combat games within the horror genre, many other titles incorporated at least some elements into their framework to differentiate themselves from the pack. Quite a few of these games tend to use inordinate or unusual forms of weaponry or combat to fight off enemies to progress through the game. Luigi's Mansion, while being far more family friendly in its approach to horror compared to most of the games I cover, makes use of household appliances as weaponry to deliver a non-violent, though action-oriented experience that remains significantly spooky and engaging. To a lesser degree, Alien Isolation, which does feature firearms and melee weapons, emphasizes the futility of their use against the titular alien to promote non-violent or stealthy solutions to subdue the savage sadistic stalker. As I mentioned in the case of Fatal Frame, combat takes the form of photography. Likewise, Michigan Report from Hell takes the cameraman viewpoint a step further to distance the players from direct control while remaining integral to the experience. But how effective is this non-violent approach to survival horror that would make these types of games more engaging or preferable to a standard action-oriented title? There are two games in particular that I'd like to shine the spotlight on today for their approach to this style. Fatal Frame 4, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, and Michigan Report from Hell. While Fatal Frame 4 is part of a longer running series and Michigan was a one-off niche title, both were developed by Grasshopper Manufacturer within a few years of each other and featured distinct variations of camera-based gameplay. Interestingly enough, neither of these games have been released in North America, nor were the original development teams involved in their translations for international audiences. Both titles offered unique takes on survival horror well before modern horror devs decide to stop evolving non-violent approaches and regress into walking simulators devoid of anything that resembles gameplay. I'll save my full thoughts for another day, but I'll simply state that I cannot stand walking simulators for a multitude of reasons. So with that in mind, grab your camera, a handful of herbal medicines, and slowly shuffle your feet as we uncover the evolution of non-violent, indirect survival horror through the camera's lens. Before we get into the meat of the episode, let's first define violent and passive styles of survival horror to get a basic foundation for our non-violent definition. For the purposes of this not-so-quick section, we'll be using Silent Hill for The Room for our example of violent and Clock Tower 3 for passive, as they are both PlayStation 2 era entries from recognizable franchises. I'm sure there are much better examples out there of these two styles, but I also guarantee you that I don't already have footage of those recorded and ready to use on my hard drive. Though the gameplay styles will vary greatly between the two types, and even more so within their umbrellas, key features such as, but not limited to, gameplay focused and item management need to be present, but most importantly, failure or death states need to be present in order to qualify as survival horror. Very few walking sim style horror games feature any of these aspects, which disqualifies them from being part of the genre. If you can't die, 
it's not survival. Violent combat focused games are easily the most common form of survival horror a player will run into. These games primarily focus on using firearms, melee weapons, or some form of direct combat to dispatch enemies to make progress. In the case of Silent Hill 4 The Room, not that one, melee combat steals the show as players are given a multitude of weapons such as pipes, baseball bats, and golf clubs to fight off enemies with only a few firearms with limited ammo being available. Enemies in The Room are aggressive and block Henry's way, almost always requiring you to kill them to make it through the tight, claustrophobic passages and hallways. Unlike games like Res Resident Evil, the Silent Hill series as a whole requires enemies to be killed twice to be considered dead. For most enemies, this means attacking them enough for them to be knocked to the ground and then followed up with a double tap to keep them from reviving and starting the process all over again. The room additionally expands the idea with ghosts in addition to standard enemies, which can revive over and over again unless pinned to the ground with a sacred sword. Failing to do so will allow these ghosts to pursue you throughout the game and even into other areas from my understanding. While it is possible to play the this game without killing everything you come into contact with, it is far more beneficial for players to clear areas completely as healing items are in short supply as well as your sidekick Eileen being an ineffective fighter. Horrific imagery and chilling sound design really drive home the violent aspects of the title to complement the combat oriented approach to make a fairly effective and highly frustrating experience. If you look at the series overall, each game seems to get more and more combat oriented while simultaneously introducing less combat ready protagonists to balance out the power dynamic. To contrast this idea, the Resident Evil series made each subsequent protagonist more capable with each new entry, making the horror aspects of the game more of a set dressing than an actual focus. Passive oriented titles are a bit more uncommon but not as niche as you may think. These titles typically do not feature any combat or in the event they do, they are not the focus of the game and are instead used as set pieces such as boss fights. Instead, stealth mechanics or defensive gameplay items are given to the players to defend themselves while retaining that feeling of vulnerability. Clock Tower 3 is a prime example of this style as it primarily features defensive gameplay throughout a majority of the game with a single type of combat present that is only available in boss fights, which honestly is so janky and ineffective at being true combat that it feels more of an extension of defense items than anything else. Early on in the game, Alyssa is given a bottle of holy water that increases in usage capacity throughout the story, which is used to solve puzzles and stun enemies. Additional items such as invisibility bands and lavender water are given in short supply to help players recover from panic in the event they are caught off guard by the stalkers. Despite being the only clock tower title to give players direct control over their character instead of pointing and clicking, you never really feel like you're in control of any given situation. You still must be aware of your surroundings and the persistent threat of stalker enemies using the app mentioned items in addition to single-use environmental defense items and hiding places. While the overall gameplay may vary, the most important aspect of this style is maintaining vulnerability while implementing some form of player interaction in the form of puzzles or even indirect combat. Non-violent survival horror shares many aspects with both violent and passive styles while creating a unique take on the genre. These games use inordinate or indirect methods of combat to fill out the spectrum while retaining the hallmarks of survival horror. Due to the nature of this approach, it's difficult to put a single definition or multiple defining hallmarks that must be present in each game. That being said, they must still at least feature survival aspects that include failure or death states. So to fully explore and comprehend this style, let's jump into our two primary examples, Fatal Frame 4 and Michigan. The Fatal Frame series began its life on the PlayStation 2 before being acquired in part by Nintendo during the 7th console generation. This era was quite experimental for many games in general, but it was during the PlayStation 2 era that survival horror began to evolve the popular fixed camera angles and tank controls in all sorts of directions. As Silent Hill and Resident Evil seemed to continue down the action-y path, numerous new IPs were born that toyed with the idea of limited to no combat or an entirely different type of gameplay to replace it. Fatal Frame as a series is actually not one I'm particularly fond of, for reasons I really can't nail down. I personally only completed the first and fourth entries and given up several times on the fan favorite entry Crimson Butterfly. The series is heavily influenced by Japanese folklore and ancient customs, with a considerable influence from modern horror media to make for a unique approach to survival horror design. Like many of its survival horror cousins, the series primarily features young female protagonists, although all but one entry have a single male character to control in at least one part of the game. Of those games, only Fatal Frame 4 features a different form of combat for its male character that keeps in line with the inordinate gameplay of the series. 
And speaking of the gameplay, this aspect of Fatal Frame is honestly my favorite part of the game. There is no combat in a traditional sense, but you still need to monitor health and manage inventory to solve environmental puzzles while being pursued by various enemies. Like its inspiration, Luigi's Mansion, the game features spirits and ghosts as common enemies, complete with their own background stories and profiles that are available to read upon successfully capturing them. You are never given a single gun or melee weapon to defend yourself from enemies, and instead you are given the power of a camera, aptly named the Camera Obscura. Oh, according to Tofu, it's actually not well named. A Camera Obscura is a room outfitted to become a camera. Basically, you are standing inside the bellows of a camera in this setup. Okay, well, it's not aptly named. I was wrong. But you use this to fight and capture aggressive spirits and ghosts in addition to uncovering secrets in the world. Instead of ammo, you find various forms of film that are somehow scattered about in ancient caves and abandoned buildings for some reason. The camera can be upgraded through the use of spiritual energy and enhanced with various lenses. In the fourth title, each character you play as is given a different variation of the camera obscura that is complete with its own lenses and sets of upgrade to change up the gameplay as Skosh. Unlike Ruka, Maroka, and Misaki, all of who use a camera at some point in the game, our lone male protagonist Kirishima instead uses a spirit stone flashlight that is far stronger against ghosts comparatively, though it must have a specific lens equipped to mimic the photography aspect of the game. The use of a camera and a flashlight as weapons accurately simulates combat without resorting to being outright violent. Due to the nature of ghosts and spirits, they are able to freely move about hiding in walls and various items strewn about the environment. The camera is equipped with a sensor that will alert players to a spiritual presence, though it isn't readily known if it's an enemy encounter or simply something strange going on. Additionally, the tone of the game is far more serious and tense than your run-of-the-mill action title. The game relies on atmospheric sound to make every creak, shudder, and crash keep you on your toes. Much of the horror is presented through notes and apparitions that provide clues to the horrific events that took place on the island a decade ago. Enemy designs turn familiar, ordinary humans into terrifying spectral forms that maintain just enough humanity to deliver an effective spook. Though the game shirks away from being outright violent, the player needs to maintain their health and film inventory as you can easily be cornered and killed by one of the many spooky spectral stalkers that haunt these halls. The hallmarks of survival horror are alive and well in the series despite its shift from typical design choice, though overall it's one of the safer approaches to non-violent design. Unlike Fatal Frame before and after it, Michigan Report from Hell took the camera-based gameplay and evolved it in a completely new direction. Michigan, taking place near Lake Michigan in Chicago, and not the state like you were probably assuming, sees the players take the role of a cameraman for Zaka TV as they try to uncover the truth of a monster invasion in the city. Known simply as Hey You or Cameraman throughout the game, the players are tasked with filming various reporters alongside microphone operator Briscoe, who is voiced by someone who realized partway through recording that they were not being paid for their work. The design for this title in particular is fascinating as you have no direct control over the combat in the game, making it somewhat of a second person experience? Basing my thoughts on the European English version of the game, the tone is a stark difference to Fatal Frame, being fairly comical and hilarious both in its translation and delivery of the voice acting. Each stage has the potential for new characters, though the cameraman and Briscoe are present throughout the story. Completing a stage rewards points based on the filming choices you made, split up into three categories, immoral, suspense, which is the default, and being a game that Suda51 worked on, erotic. There are four distinct endings to the game, two suspense, one immoral, and one erotic one, which requires you to film up women's skirts for an extended period of time, in addition to finding erotic art scattered throughout the stages. I didn't say this was a classy game, so don't blame me, I am just the messenger. During the tutorial stage, we are given all the tools we will ever have at our disposal. Filming, guiding the reporter, and calling out actions to the NPCs to attempt. The cameraman has a single defensive maneuver, shoving, which is primarily used to push the reporter out of harm's way in the event the enemy gets a drop on them. With the exception of Briscoe, every reporter can be killed if they are not properly warned of approaching danger, as well as the cameraman being able to die in certain stages. This is where the survival aspect is brought into play. In the event a reporter dies, the stage ends and you are sent to the next where a new reporter takes their place. Occasionally reporters will change of their own volition throughout the story based on the stage you're playing, but the game will remember the fate of those who died. Depending on your actions, you may never see certain reporters during your playthrough, nor will you uncover the real truth if everyone meets a grisly end. As I mentioned, the cameraman can die in very specific circumstances, which prompts a retry stage option instead of carrying on with the new character. While guiding reporters through the stage, 
The cameraman can have some limited influence on the paths they take, calling out locations of keys and important environmental objects, which allow the reporter to pick up what is needed to move on. Additionally, enemy encounters are handled entirely in this fashion, with players calling out an enemy's location to prompt the reporter to fire a single shot at a time. Occasionally, this system can be incredibly irritating as the NPCs are slow to react and there is a cooldown on every single action you take, but it enhances the tension in an otherwise low-key horror experience. Although it is very rough around the edges, this style of survival horror is truly a rarity in the genre, despite being effective in its design. The removal of direct combat from the player harkens back to point-and-click games such as Clock Tower and Night Trap, while making the limited action sequences tense and frantic due to the sluggish nature of the controls. Even with gunplay having a very limited appearance, a majority of the combat and interactivity focuses on defense rather than aggression. You will spend most of your time looking for inordinate solutions to enemy encounters, such as shoving reporters from being attacked, closing doors and shutters to stop pursuing enemies, or instructing your team to get a monster at a nightclub drunk to kill it with techno music. Again, all the hallmarks of survival horror are present without resorting to mere violence to ensure your success. It's just a shame this style of survival horror kind of died off in recent years with the rise of walking simulators. Overall, I feel the non-violent approach to the genre provides a great middle ground that will keep players engaged while providing an experience that is both unusual and unique that uses restrictions to its advantage. The idea of non-violent or indirect approaches to survival horror is a tricky one to pull off, but when it works, it can be something far more effective compared to actioning or passive titles. Removing some aspects of control or limiting the players just enough brings a different yet tense experience that is rarely duplicated and almost never perfected. But is it the most effective form of survival horror? Honestly, it comes down to a multitude of personal factors as horror as a whole is completely subjective. But there are still quite a few factors that are integral to game design in general, one major aspect being how well the gameplay systems and player interfaces work together. Although we looked at two titles that show how this approach to survival horror can work, I think it's only fair that we give one that does not work. In our two main games, the gameplay enhances the narrative themes while giving you a sense of urgency and importance to your actions to ensure your survival. Fatal Frame takes a more direct approach, putting the combat and exploration completely in your hands, while Michigan takes a more hands-off second-person perspective where you have influence over the action but not directly. But what about removing your control almost completely from the situation, instead relying on an AI character to perform the task guided merely by suggestions? Lifeline comes to mind as the best example of how to not approach this style. In Lifeline, you use a microphone in your smooth, buttery, albeit monotone voice to guide Rio through the hotel. The game removes your direct control completely, instead giving you a series of commands and actions expressed via voice recognition to direct Rio through enemy encounters and exploration. When it works, which is not as often as it should, it is a novel concept that could be expanded upon. When it doesn't, the survival horror aspect and general funness quickly melts away, leaving only an empty, unfulfilling experience in its place. Though these games may not always be completely effective in their design, they do show how experimentation with this genre could produce so many alternatives to the tried and true approaches that are still plaguing creativity and gaming now. That's it for me. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Retrosaurus. If you liked the video, a like and a comment go a long way, and a subscription does help support the channel. If you'd like to support the series more directly, please head on over to the Patreon. There's a link in the description, or search for Kyoryu Hunter. And speaking of Kyoryu Hunter, you can find me on all social media at Kyoryu Hunter, which is easier to spell than it is to say. Well, that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and I will see you next time here on Retrosaurus. Goodbye.